the Word? I hope you are. I, I'm really ready. I've been uh, studying this uh, quite a bit. So we're going to find ourselves in, in uh, chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 26 to 30 is where we're going to be. Um, I want to go ahead and, and stand and read that, kind of prepare our hearts. But then I want to go back to chapter 7 just for a moment. So let's stand together. Romans, Romans chapter 8, let's start in verse 26. And we'll read through verse 30. And then uh, Larry Buck, after we finish verse 30, would you mind praying for us? So Romans chapter 8, verse 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He, did, he also did predestinate to be conformed in the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He did predestinate, them He also called. And whom He called, them He also justified. And whom He justified, them He also glorified. Larry, would you mind praying for us? Amen. Amen. Maybe seated. If you can go back to Romans chapter seven just for a moment. I want to kind of set the stage. Um, would you all agree with me that the battle between the flesh and the spirit is a real battle? That it is a fight? Uh, some of us fought that battle this morning. Rolling out of bed, looking out the window. Uh, I can stay right here. It have been pretty easy just to roll over and, and hug the pillow and, and snuggle up in the blanket. But you're here, and I, I praise God for that. Um, I want to go back to Romans chapter 7 because what, what we read in Romans chapter 8 flows out of what we read in chapter 7. You remember this Dr. Seuss passage that we looked at a few weeks ago, um, where, where Paul is like, man, I can't do anything right, and, the, and I always do it wrong, and the stuff I, I want to do, I end up, you know, so let's just read that. He says, verse 14, chapter 7, verse 14, he says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Does that describe you? You're like, I don't even know what I just read. Well, let's read it again. Let's read it again. Look at verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not. The thing that I find myself doing, I don't want to do that. I, it's not like I give myself permission to do it, and yet I find myself doing that. You ever ask a little kid, why are you doing that? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I, I don't know. Why did you? I don't know why I did it. There's absolutely no explanation other than my flesh really wanted to do it, and so I did it. Right, middle of verse 15. He, he says, For that which I would, I, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is what? It's good. He says, I'm not good. The, every time I get in, into sin, every time I get wrong, I recognize that God's Word is good. I recognize how, how good and how holy and how awesome God is and how, how much I'm not. Now, we are tore up from the floor up, are we not? Now, look, this is how, that, that's my vernacular. That's my, that's my translation of verse 24. Look at verse 24. Oh, wretched man that I am, tore up from the floor up. Right? I am a mess. I am wretched. And this is what Paul says at, the, at his conclusion. He says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? What's he talking about? He's talking about his flesh, isn't he? He's talking about this, this, this flesh that has itches that, that want to be scratched. And he goes, I'm just stuck in this flesh and I want out. I want out of this thing. How do I get out of that? And he says, verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with my flesh, with the flesh, the law of sin. So he says, okay, I'm torn between two natures here. I, I have a desire to be with God. I have a desire to be outside of my body. And yet here I am stuck in my body and I'm going to continue doing what I need to be doing. So I have to have my mind right. I have to have my head right. Everybody track it with me? Because if your head is not right, it's not long until you get take a nosedive into sin. Truth? 
That is the reality. So look over here in Romans chapter 8. Specifically, I want to look in verse, verse 22. He says in verse 22, for we, for we know that the whole creation, that's the, that's the trees, that's the rocks, that's the, that's the streams, that's the rivers, it's, it's you name it, it's the whole creation. What's, it, what is, what's creation doing? What's it say? It's groaning, isn't it? It groaneth. It's like, would they just hurry up and leave, please? So here's, here's Paul over here in chapter 7, verse 24, saying, I'm a wretched man. I want to be delivered from the body of this death. And then you get over here to chapter 8 and verse 22, creation saying, yes, Lord. Yes, get them off of here. Get them out of here. They need to be redeemed. They need to be off of this planet. Now look what he says in verse 23. In verse 23 he says, and not only they, but ourselves also. That's what, that's, we agree with Paul, don't we? Romans chapter 7 verse 24, we agree, that, oh man, I'm wretched. And not only that, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. We are groaning every single day. We recognize that we are in a fleshly body and we need to redeem. We need to be redeemed. We need a new body in Christ. And here he is, he's groaning, and that's you and me. So we are an absolute wreck when we're in the flesh. And there's no doubt about it that when we are in the flesh, everything around us pays the price. That's why creation groaned. That's why you groan. Now check this out in verse 26. He says, likewise. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with what? With groanings. With groanings which cannot be uttered. So you have the creation groaning, you have you and your flesh groaning, and then you also have the Spirit of God which dwells inside of you. It is groaning. And how is it groaning? It's groaning in prayer, crying out to God. What's creation doing? Groaning. Lord, how long? What's your, what you, what's your flesh saying? What are you saying in your, in your own spirit? Lord, how long? Give us a body like you. What, what's the Spirit of God saying? Lord, how long do I need to be trapped in this guy's body? Get me out of here. I'm stuck. And he's groaning. And that's the context that we find ourselves in verses 26 to 30. Is we are a mess. Everybody say amen. We are a mess. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a mess. Uh-huh. You're a mess. I'm a mess. We're all a mess. And we all need redemption, do we not? We are looking forward to that glorious day that we get a body like Christ. But in the meantime, what do we do? We suffer, don't we? We go through some hard times. We go through some difficult times. And let me tell you, it's in those hard times where we are, we are gripped with our flesh and our flesh has a grip of us that we lose sight of some things. We lose sight of spiritual things. We lose sight uh, of godly things. We lose sight of a desire to pray. We, we get mad at God when things don't go our way. We get upset and we lose sight of what God is really uh, accomplishing in our life. That's the context of chapter, tw chapter 8, verse 26 through, through verse 30. I'm struggling with my mouth today. All right, so here's the very first point I want you to see in verse 27. Let's just read it one more time. I'll give you the point. He says, and he that searches, sorry, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Anybody have infirmities? We all have infirmities of some kind, don't we? Whether it be a physical limitation, an addiction, bitterness, uh, you name it. We all have infirmities of some kind. He says, the Spirit helps you there. It helps our, it helps with our infirmities. Why? For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. That we can get so messed up in our thinking that we lose sight of how to pray and what to pray. And so what happens? The Spirit comes in and prays for us. For the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Here's the point. Here we go. One more slide. And I know the lighting in here is bad. But when we don't know what to pray, this is important to get. When we don't know what to pray, we know the Spirit of God is praying according to the will of God. Now notice what he says in verse 26 that he prays for us, verse 27. He says, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to what? The will of God, right? So when you don't know what to pray... Praise the Lord, you have somebody's praying for you, interceding for you. 
Amen? That's important. So when you don't know what to pray, you know this, that the Spirit of God is praying for you according to the will of God. Now here's the deal. The Spirit prays for us when we get focused on us. That's, that's, if you could sum it up, that's how I would sum it up. The Spirit prays for us when we focus on us. It's pretty simple. When you don't know how to pray, you get focused on yourself. And our, and our prayers become very selfish, do they not? Lord, give me. I want. I need this. Give me that. We become very selfish in our prayers. And the Spirit of God is inside of us going, don't agree with that one. That's not according to the will of God. And the Spirit of God is groaning within us, praying, interceding for us with groanings which cannot be uttered because we're uttering crazy prayers. Because we're asking to consume it upon our own lust, not according to God's will. Right, track it with me? That's the context of this. We don't know what to pray. There's times when we get very selfish, don't we? Or we get very repetitious, praying the exact same thing over and over and over and over again, thinking that God is going to hear us for our much speaking. That doesn't work like that, does it? How about this? There's also times where our prayers become very empty. Lord, just. Lord, just this, and Lord, just that, and Father, this, and Father, that, and Father, this, and Father, that, and just, 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 and this, this, this. And we haven't said anything. We've said Father a whole lot of time. we said the word just a whole lot of times, and our prayers have been very, very vague. We've accomplished absolutely nothing in our prayer. Well, we don't know what to pray, but we just throw something up when the Spirit of God is inside of us groaning. But how about this? What about when you just go into complete coma and you haven't prayed in a long time? You just quit praying because you're so focused on self. You, you're just going to do it on your own. You don't need the Lord. What's the Spirit doing? It's praying for you because you're focused on yourself. Wow. That was, that was ripped my guts out when I was putting all that together this week. And when, Lord, that convicts me. That absolutely convicts me. Because when I don't know what to pray, I know that the Spirit of God is praying for me. Have you ever been there where you've, where you've uh, woke up in the middle of the night, 3 o'clock in the morning, and you just feel like something's not right and you just need to pray, but you don't know what to pray? We call that the Spirit of God praying for you, groaning for you. You don't know what to do. Lord, I, I'm, I'm awake. I, I feel like I need to pray, but I don't know what to pray. That's the Spirit of God praying for you, inside of you, groaning within you. The Spirit of God prays for us when we get focused on us. Now, notice this. I, 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 we have to look at this just for a moment. Let's just mention this in passing here. The last part of verse 26. He says, But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings, which cannot be, what? It can't be, it's not vocalized. They're not verbalized. It, it's silent. It's groaning that happens inside of us. And so I would just say this, it, the Spirit prays with silent prayers. The, the Spirit prays with silent groanings. This is not a verse to turn to if you're trying to confirm that we're supposed to speak in tongues of some kind. This is often used as a proof text for, for speaking in tongues. And the Bible makes it very clear in verse 26. So it's the Spirit of God praying for sure, uh, but it's praying with groanings that cannot be verbalized. It can't be vocalized. There's no utterance uh, involved in it. It's all internal. Right? You ever had this uneasiness in you and there's something going on and just, there's war going on inside of you. You don't know what in the world's going on, but there's like battle taking place inside of you. That's the Spirit of God groaning. That's what it is. We've all been there, have we? Not? If you've got the Spirit of God inside of you, you've been there. What I'm describing, you know it. You should be experiencing this all the time because you have the Spirit of God inside of you. There's just this uneasiness. I don't know what's going on. We're resting this. You don't know what to pray, so the Spirit of God prays for you. There should be great comfort in that. Absolutely. Now, you, when you know what to pray, you pray. Now, how does, it, how does the Spirit of God always praying? He says in verse 27, the last part, He's always praying according to the will of God. Every time, I'm going to take a drink, I'm sorry. It's always praise according to the will of God. Well, how should we pray? Always according to the will of God. We should always be vocalizing and praying according to the will of God. Not our will be done, but thy will be done. Isn't that what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 6? 
the Spirit prays according to God's will. This is important to get. The Spirit prays according to God's will when we get focused on our will. When I get focused on myself, when I get focused on my will, the Spirit of God comes in and says, I'll intercede. Don't listen to him. <laughs> That's a foolish prayer that he's praying. I want to I pray for him. I want to I intercede for him. And I would boil it down to this. Very simple. The Spirit prays because our will gets in the way. Very simple. If you could boil everything we just talked about in verses 26 to 27, I would boil it down to that. The Spirit prays because our will gets in the way. Very simple. Don't pray, uh, don't pray, pray vain prayers, empty prayers. Don't pray selfish prayers. Pray according to the will of God. And when you lose sight of the reason or what to pray, you don't know how to pray, you don't know what to pray, rest in this. The Spirit of God is groaning inside of you and it's praying for you. It is interceding for you. Well, praise the Lord for that. Now, let's shift gears because this is where I want to spend the bulk of our time. This is in verse 28 through 30. He says, and we know, like, like this is common knowledge, right? We know this. I'm like, well, I didn't know that until you told me that, but thank you. I appreciate it. We know this. He says, back, look, I thought this was interesting in, in verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together. Well, I didn't know that until you told me. He's like, he's sharing knowledge with me that, that I, I, I feel like I should already know. He goes, now we know this. He says in verse 28, we know that all things work together. We love this verse, don't we? We love to quote this verse. All things work together. Uh, sorry. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. How many times you heard that verse in your life? Stub your toe. All things work together for good. You said a non-Jesus word, you could have quoted Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Right? All things work together for good. Something goes bad in your life. Well, you know, all things work together for good. Well, they don't read the rest of the verse. Right? They don't quote the rest of the verse. We just like to quote the very first part of the verse. And I think there's a misunderstanding of what this verse is teaching. Because this is more than just a cute little verse. It's more than something you put on a wall, on a plaque. There, there's a whole lot more to this thing than, than just saying all things work together for good. No, keep reading. All things work together for good to them that love God. All things work together for good to them who are the called according to His purpose. That's the point. There's a whole lot more going on there, isn't there? Listen, there are times where I get called to a hospital. Praise the Lord, it's not hap that doesn't happen very often. There's times where I get called in a counseling situation. And I'll just be honest, there are times where I just want to run to this verse because it's a blanket verse that I can run to. Well, all things work together for good. And you go quoting that to somebody that's in their pain, you just might get a fist to the face because it's hard for them to see that. Isn't it? I mean, if you're going through something very, very difficult and somebody comes in, well, you know, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, pulling a verse, ripping it out of context and slamming it upside your head. Well, I want to... I want to pop you in the nose. Don't be telling me that. All things work together for good. Explain my situation. Explain why I'm going through the hell that I'm going through. And we try to pull this verse and we try to apply it to our lives and we don't understand the context of it. This is very, very important to get. All things work together for good, yes, but it's to them that love God. It's promised to them who love God. Well, check this out. Here's the, here's the point. When we don't know what God is doing, we know that the children of God are being conformed into the image of God. Here's the understanding. You have to understand verses 29 and 30 before you can fully understand what verse 28 says. So notice what verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Why? For whom He did for no. He also did predestinate to be conformed to whose image? The image of His Son. 
that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What is the will of God for your life? Here it is, verse 29, that you would be conformed to the image of his Son. So when, when God bring, when all things work together for good, what's the good? We'll get to that here in just a few moments. There is a good that we have to talk about. But the understanding is, we try to pull verse, 20 out, verse 28 out of its entire context and to try to make it fit into certain situations that it may not necessarily fit in. Because who's this promise to? He says in verse 28, it's to them who love God. It's to them who love God. Well, 1 John chapter 1, or sorry, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love him because he first loved, he loved us. It's promised not to just those who love God, but to those who are the called according to his purpose. We've looked at this verse at nauseum. Let's read it one more time. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called, what? The sons of God. Now, look at this, Romans chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. He says, among whom are ye also the called. That, that, that those two words together only show up twice in your Bible, both of them in Romans. One time here in Romans chapter 1 and verse 6, the other in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. That's the only time they show up. Among whom ye, are ye also the called of Jesus Christ, verse, verse 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be what? Saints. So here's something very important. This verse does not apply to anybody who does not know Christ. It does not apply. You can't take Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 and give it to a coworker who does not know Christ because they don't get that promise. They're not promised that. All things aren't working together for good for them. All things are working for them to bow their knee and come to salvation in Christ. That's what all things are doing for them. He's drawing them uh, to himself. Now, you, uh, you can make a case. Well, isn't that pretty good? Yeah, it is, but not in the context of what we're talking about here. This is very, this is very misunderstood, I think. This is, a, this is a verse that only applies to the saved. Those who love God and those who are the called according to his purpose. Well, when do you receive that calling? After you receive Christ. That's when you receive the calling. Now, we'll get into predestination and all those things here in just a few moments. But notice what he says in verse 28 again. Let's just read it. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Check this out. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. I love this verse. I do. I love this verse. It's in the context of the church, by the way. He says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a what work? A good work. In you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Matt Kerr and I were just talking about this verse this last, this, earlier this week. He says, that he which hath begun a good work in you. That's justification. He began that good work when you got saved. That's justification. We'll perform it until the day. Well, what does that mean? He's sanctifying you. He, he didn't just begin a work. He's continuing that work all the way. That's sanctification. So justification, sanctification until the day of Jesus Christ. That's the glorification, isn't it? That's the day that we get glorified. So there's justification and sanctification and glorification right there. There's right there in that verse. What's the end? Re he began a good work in salvation. Well, that work does not come and does not come into a close until the day of Jesus Christ. He will perform it. He will accomplish it. Chapter two and verse thirteen: For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. It's His good pleasure, not mine. Listen, we have a different, a lot different definition of good. Don't we? God's definition of good and my definition of good, not always the same thing. I mean, I think it would be a good idea for God to bless me with millions of dollars. That's a good idea, isn't it? Add a brand new truck. My house to be paid off. 
Those are good ideas. Except I wouldn't need him anymore. Make sense? That's not necessarily a good thing. Because it's very fleshly, isn't it? I have good ideas that aren't necessarily biblical and great godly ideas. But I got some good ideas. You know? Uh, no doubt about it. We have definite, different definitions of what is good. Look what he says in verse 28 and 29 again. He says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. So listen, when you don't know what God is doing, you ever been there? Am I the only one in the house? You, you've been in a spot where you don't know what God is doing. Look, I don't know what you're doing, God, but if, you can stop anytime. You can quit at any moment. It'd be okay with me. You ever been to that point, to that moment, where you're going through it and you don't know, you, you thought, I, I can't handle anymore. You're still here. You're still here. You're still ticking. You're still going. And you get to those points and you, now you understand. Wait a second. It would be a good idea for God to quit in my mind. But God says, oh, you're not done yet. You're not where I need you yet. You're not done cooking yet. I still need to do some work in you because you're not submitted to my pleasure. You're not submitted to, 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 to my good purpose. I'm continuing to do a work inside of you. Now, if I could boil verse 28 down just for a moment, I would put it this way. Many believers can't see the good because they're focused on the difficulty. Listen, Romans 8.28 is a promise to all of God's children. And a whole lot of God's children don't claim that promise because they can't see. They can't see the good. All they see is the difficulty. Truth? I don't understand it. Why are we having to do this? Why, why, why do I have to keep going through all this? Because you're not done yet. And you just hear God whispering, all things work together for good. To them who love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose, then why am I struggling? Why am I having a hard time seeing it? Because you just need to sit back and enjoy the ride. Well, it's easy for you to say. You're not the one holding on for dear life. No, but I've been there. I've been there. I always uh, like to compare our walk with God our salvation. You can go to 2 Corinthians 6 just for a moment. I like to compare it to a roller coaster. Anybody like roller coasters? I love me some roller coasters. Now I'm 42. Well, I'm going to be 42 this year. My body doesn't necessarily like roller coasters anymore. Now, if you get on a roller coaster that does that roundy rounds type stuff, I'm out. Not going. And you don't want to enjoy that ride with me. Because I guarantee you won't enjoy the ride. I'll just put it that way. But when you have a walk with God, it's that, that intrepidation where you're, you're in line and you're getting ready to get on the ride. How many of you have been on a roller coaster? I just want to know that we're all on the same page. All right, just make it sure. You get, you're in line and, and you're hearing everybody doing the screaming and the shouting and you're like, where's the chicken exit? But I really want to do this. I don't want to punk out. I'm going to do this thing. And you, you finally get in. So it's your turn next. And here comes the cars. And everybody's hair's like crazy. And they're gnarly. And they're like huffing and puffing. You're like, I don't really want to do this, but I want to do it. But that's salvation. You're seeing everybody have this walk with God. And you've heard them screaming. And you've heard them shouting. You've, had them, you've heard them laughing. And then sometimes they don't look all the way put together. And yet you say, I still want to get on this ride. That's salvation, right? You get in and you sit down. You say, I'm, I'm submitted. I'm going to go. And what, are they, what happens? They hopefully, remember the days of the Zambezi Zinger where there were no uh, seatbelts? So, 
the seats you down and you're like checking it three or 4,000 times to make sure it's still working, right? It reminds me of a video that I'll tell you later about. Oh my, it's funny. Anyway, so <laughs> you get clinked down. What is that? What's well, secure in Christ, isn't it? That's being sealed with the Spirit of God. And all of a sudden, get me off! Too late. Too late. You're secure. You're not getting out. You're not getting out. And now you're on the ride. And what does almost every roller coaster do? You're like, this is not so bad. This is all right. I hate heights. But it's okay. I'm secure. I'm not going anywhere. And all of a sudden, you're like, like plateaus. You're like, you all know that feeling, don't you? You're just like, because you're living it right now. You're like, uh, and you go down, and it's going. You just go absolutely crazy. You're like, I want off of this thing. And then all of a sudden, you're upside down. You're flipping around. People are shouting their glory, hallelujah. They're excited, and you want to wet your pants. You're freaking out. You know, just what, what's going on? And all of a sudden, you find yourself giggling, and you're having a good time. And the lady behind you is screaming. You're like, in this blast. Oh! She's not having any fun. But by the end of the ride, you're like. And that was full of ups and downs and hills and turns. But that was awesome. Can we do it again? <laughs> Can we do it again? That's what it looks like to serve Christ. Where was I going with that analogy? I have absolutely no idea where I was going with that. Oh, here's where I was going. Come back. Chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Many believers can't see the good because they're focused on the difficulty. They can't see that the roller coaster is going to be fun because all they see is the upside down. All they see is a sudden, sudden fall about one quarter of the way into it. They can't enjoy the fun. So 2 Corinthians chapter 6, look what he says. This is Paul. Look what he says in verse 4. He says, but in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. Well, that just sounds like a good time, doesn't it? Sounds very difficult, doesn't it? Well, what happens if you have the right perspective? Look what he says, verse 8, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Well, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? The difficulty, and here he says, I'm going to choose to see the good in the face of difficulty. That is how you get to see all things work together for good. To them who love God. To them who are the called according to His purpose. Lord, I don't know what you're going through, but because I'm going through it, I know you're doing a work in me. That's the mentality to have. It doesn't mean it's easy. It means it's probably very, very difficult now stay in 2 Corinthians. Go over here to chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 23. He says, are they, are they the ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more often, in deaths oft. This is Paul laying out a little bit of his testimony. Here's the stuff that he went through. Verse 24. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. That means he was whipped five different times with thirty-nine stripes each time. Verse, verse 25. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and day I have been in the deep. Now that is one of the greatest fears that I have. And I live in Kansas. I'm just saying. Snakes, spiders, and sharks. Pretty much if it starts with an S, I'm out. I'm just saying. 
So he's, he's floating out in the deep for a night and a day. He says, verse 26, in journeyings often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches." <gasps> That's difficulty. Now look over here in chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And look what he says in verse 7. He says, Unless I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Now we don't know what that thorn in the flesh is. We have a pretty good idea. But Paul says, there was a thorn in the flesh given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Verse 8, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice, three times, that it might depart from me. Lord, take this thorn away. Lord, take this thorn away. Lord, take this thorn away. And God answers the prayer. He answers. Verse 9, they said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. What was his answer? Nope. No, Paul. I guarantee he would think of every good reason why. I wouldn't need anybody to lead me by hand. I could do a whole lot of writing. I wouldn't have to do everything by dictation. I could travel where I wanted to without somebody having to, to lead me by the way. And what, is, what does God say? No. No, my strength is made perfect in weakness. So here's his, here's his response. All things work together for good. To them who love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. That was His response. And you see that in the middle of verse 9. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my what? There's that word again. What's the Spirit doing in our infirmities? He's helping us in our infirmities. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. He goes, listen, I'm going to embrace the difficulty because when I embrace the difficulty, that's when I get the good. That's where I see that all things work together for good. It's in that moment where I embrace it. All right, going back to Romans chapter 8. Because he says, all things work together for good. Well, what is the good? Well, that's found in verse 29. That's found in verse 30. Now, we're going to have to have a little theological discussion here. All right? Verse 29. He says, for whom he did for no." He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. That's the good. That is the good. To be conformed to the image of His Son, that, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. So what is the good? Well, let me tell you what it's not. Here's what it's not. It's not being predestinated to salvation, as some would try to make this verse say. This is not saying that you are predestined to salvation. Has anybody ever heard of that before? Predestination, predestined to salvation. He says, for whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Now he uses the word for no and he uses the word predestination, doesn't he? No doubt about it. We're not trying to shirk those, shirk those words. Let's, let's just meet them head on. So, he's not talking about pre being predestined to salvation. In other words, Calvinism or Reformed theology, covenant theology, which just says simply this, uh, before you did anything good or bad, before you were even born, God chose who was going to be saved and who's not. The Bible does not teach that. Amen? It does not teach that, and nor should you use this passage to even begin to remotely try to force it. It doesn't happen. He says, God, He foreknows. Is that what it says in verse 29? He says, He foreknows. He also did predestinate to be conformed. So let's just talk about foreknowledge for a moment. How is it possible for God to foreknow? He is the Alpha and the Omega, is He not? He is the beginning and the end, is He not? God is past, He is present, and He is future at the same time. Isn't He? God exists outside of time. He would not be a God worth serving if He is not able to have foreknowledge. Amen? He says, he says in the Bible, that, he, and I can't remember where it is, He declares the end from the beginning. So I, I liken it to this. 
How many readers we have in here just like to read? Three people. Me either. It's like I'll read all the time. Right, so it's like a book. Right? It's, this is how I understand foreknowledge. And, it, and I know every analogy breaks down. I get that. But it's just like a book. You, you have the book. The story is contained in the book. Right? Page 32 is contingent what's happening on page 15. And page 274, what happens on page 32. No doubt about it. They're all tied together. But you as the reader, you exist outside of the story. Don't you? And you get to pick and choose where you jump into the story wherever you want. If you want to be a spoiler, you can jump straight to the end. Read it. Why do you have control over the future? Don't ever do that. It's not fun. Ruins the book, right? Ruins, so you have control of the future, but you can start in the very beginning, or you can jump right in the middle. Right? You have control of the story. Well, that's God. God exists outside of time. He's able to see past, present, and future at the exact same moment. In fact, He's there already. You can't be at a time where He hasn't already been, and where He isn't already, been, where He isn't already, He's already there. I don't know how else to say that. He's there. And then that'll blow up. Blow up your string theory, all kinds of stuff, won't it? He exists outside of time. Time is only, we're, we're stuck, we're relevant in time where we, God exists outside of it. So he has, foreknowledge, no doubt about it. And I would tie it to this as well. Foreknowledge does not mean foreordained. That's important to get. Just because God knows it's going to happen doesn't mean that he's ordained it to happen. If that were the case, then we would be nothing. Right? Back with me? This is a, I, I want to make sure that we understand this on a, on a theological level. We've got to get this. Foreknowledge does not mean foreordained. Right? You've all been there. You've been in a situation where you know how it's going to go before you even get out of the car. You don't believe me? Hang out with my brother-in-law for a moment. I'm going to pick on him for a moment. He always says, oh, I know how this is going to go. And most of the stinking time, he's right. <laughs> That's right. Get that on record. Most of the time, he's right on that issue. Not on everything else, but on that one. It frustrates me sometimes. You know how this is going to go. We're going to go in here. We're going to do this. And this is going to happen. And that's going to happen. And this, and this. His foreknowledge didn't mean he was forcing it to happen. He just knew this is how it's going to go down. And I can't even stink and enjoy it the whole time because I'm watching him receive. Dang it, he was right. Sharon did say, I mean, she just. <laughs> Listen, foreknowledge does not equal four. It doesn't mean that God, just because he knows it's going to happen, doesn't mean he's made it happen. Does that make sense? That's important to get. Now, let's, let's take this a step further. But it says predestinate. It says predestinate. It says predestinate. Oh, we love to stop on that word, don't we? He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. So we already know what it is not. Here's what is the good. Well, it's not uh, being predestined to salvation. Here's what the good is it's being predestined to be conformed into the image of God after your salvation. That is the good. What is God doing? He's molding and shaping us into the image of God after salvation. That's what the predestined is. Just read it. Read it for what it says. For whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Why? That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That is the will of God. What is the will of God for your life? That you be conformed to the image of Christ. Well, how do we know that? How do we know that? Because he said it right there in verse 29. That predestination, so he, he's predestined that anybody that gets saved, whoever it is that gets saved, he's not picking who gets saved, he's predestining that whoever gets saved will be now conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's, that's the predestination. Um, the other day I was watching, uh, the other day I was watching a, uh, I don't know how do you, I don't know what the title is, but it was basically watching guys 
uh, sign up to become Marines, jump on the bus, and then they get off the bus, and they go through the beginning process of becoming a Marine. Now, Dave went through that. Anybody else in here, Marine, Army, you guys know what I'm talking about. I never did that. Um, but here's these, here's these guys who even did some working out. They did some, they did some things. They went and signed on the dotted line. Yes, I'm going to choose to be Marine. Well, the moment they signed on the dotted line, there are some things that are now predestined for them. Have you tracking with me? It wasn't predestined that they'd be a Marine. But now there are some things that are predestined for them. And the moment they get on the bus, they figure that out. Like, oh, this is bad. This is bad news. What did I just sign up for? The moment they get off the bus and somebody's yelling, spitting in their face, you know, calling them all kinds of names or whatever it is, their feet are on the yellow lines and they're, they're doing all the different things and they're emptying their pockets and they're giving one last call to their mom or whatever it is. And then they jump right into it. Man, there's a lot of turmoil. There's a lot of difficulties. There's a lot of things that they have to go through. But what's predetermined for them? At the end, they're going to be wearing a uniform. And their commanding officer is going to come up and shake their hand and say, hello, Marine, or whatever that they say. It's predetermined that they would be conformed to the image of a Marine. They've been broken down and built back up to be a Marine. Everybody track with me? Now, I know every analogy breaks down, but that's, that's the only way I could maybe make it sense, right? So we are in the will of God when we are being conformed to the image of God. Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save, what? That which is lost. What's the that? It's the image of God, isn't it? That's why I love the King James Bible, because new versions don't say it. New versions just say, Save the save them that were save the lost. No, no, it saves that which was lost. Well, what was lost? It was lost in the garden, wasn't it? It's the image of God. Why did Jesus Christ come? So that we might be conformed to the image of His Son. The thing that was lost is now able to be attained because we have Christ. Right? Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. He says, Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. So we want to be after the image of Christ. No doubt about that. Now, come back here to Romans chapter 8 for a moment. And look what he says at the very end of verse 29. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. There's three things I want you to get out of this little phrase here. The first one is this. Jesus is our brother. Jesus is our brother. Why? Because we've been adopted into his family. You can see that in verses 15 and 16 of the same chapter. We've been adopted into his family. Here's the second thing I want you to see. He says he's the firstborn among many brethren. Doesn't it? Firstborn among many brethren. Jesus wants many other brothers. It's our responsibility to go lead people to Christ so that he will have many brothers. That's the second thing. The third thing I want you to see is that Jesus is the firstborn. What does that mean? It's one of, it's one of position. It's one of, it's one of, of, of responsibility. He's the firstborn. What does that mean? It means he's the one that gets the inheritance, doesn't he? He's the one that's in charge. The inheritance runs through, always runs through the firstborn. Look what he says here in Colossians chapter 1 and verses 17 and 18. And he, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Why? That in all things he might have the preeminence. That he's in charge of it all. That he comes first and foremost. He gets the inheritance, right? Look at verse 17. Go back to verse 17. Chapter 8 and verse 17. He says, And of children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. We get to participate in his inheritance. So Jesus is the firstborn. He gets the inheritance, and we participate in it because we're his brothers. We're part of the family of God. We're being conformed into His image. He's not being conformed into ours. Why can't you be more like your brother? You ever heard that one? Why can't you be just more like your sister? Why can't you be more like your brother? Well, listen, we want to be like Christ. We want to be like Him. 
Now let's kind of land the plane here. Let me, let me sum it up here. All things work together for good because God has already seen all things. That'll just sum it up perfect, doesn't it? All things work together for good. Why? Because God's already seen all things. By Him all things consist. Colossians chapter 1. We just looked at that passage. It's all things. He's already been there. He's already done it all. He's already seen it all. He is the past. He is the present. He is the future. He's there now. Wrap your mind around that one. Echo. Okay. Now, look what he says in verse 30. Verse 30. He says, moreover, whom he did predestinate. Predestinate to what? Be conformed to the image of his son. Them he also called. To them he, sorry. And, and whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also, what does it say? Glorified. Have you been glorified yet? You haven't. But this is written in the past tense. It's like you already have. Why? Because he's already been there. He's already there. That's crazy. All things work together for good. Because he's already seen all things. You've already been glorified even though it hasn't happened yet. That's crazy, isn't it? Listen, things done in the present and in the future, things done in the present and the future tense are already done in the past tense. They're already done. I'm going to give you two more passages and we'll, we'll land the plan. We'll be done. First one is 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. He says, who has saved us, and there's that word, called us, with a holy calling, not according to our works, praise the Lord, but according to His own purpose and grace. There's that word purpose again, which was given us in Christ Jesus when? Before the world began. Before even started the world, we already had all these things in Christ before you even existed. Wow, that's, that's amazing to me. What, is it, what, is, what does God say in Jeremiah? Before you were in the womb, I knew thee. I knew your name before, before you were gleaming your mother's eye. I, I, I knew you thousands of years ago, before the world began. Oh, by the way, I, I foreknew, and so I've already in Christ given you some things before the foundation of the world. That's amazing. Verse 10, he says, but is now made manifest. It's plainly seen in the present tense. It was true in the past tense, but it now it's finally being seen in the present tense. And we'll change your future tense. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who with the polished death. And he, and he goes on. Now, let me share this verse with you and we'll be done. Genesis chapter 15, verse 20. Genesis chapter 15, verse 20. Joseph had been sold into slavery by his brothers. Brothers lied to dad, soaked his coat in many colors and blood, and said, Dad, we found this, and Joseph must be dead. The whole time they sold Joseph off into slavery to some Midianites. They go down into Egypt and sold into Potiphar's house. You guys know the story? Sold into Potiphar's. He goes into Potiphar's house, and everything he touches is just almost turns to gold. I mean, everything just goes so well. So much so that Potiphar's wife says, Will you touch me? And he says, uh, No, thank you. <laughs> you don't belong to me. I would not sin against my Lord or against Potiphar in doing such a thing. And she throws, her, throws herself at him, and he gets accused of rape. And next thing you know, he's in dungeon. Um, it's in the dungeon that he meets a baker, he meets a butler, um, explains their dream. At the same time, Pharaoh's having a dream. 
And Pharaoh won't tell anybody what the dream was, but they want them, he wants them to interpret it. They're like, we can't interpret a dream if you don't tell us the dream. And he goes, well, then you're going to die. And the guy goes, I know of a guy that can interpret dreams. And so here comes Joseph, and jo Joseph comes out and, and, uh, and says, listen, I'm not the one that interprets dreams. God does. And it just interprets the next thing you know, Joseph is now the second one in command over the entire realm of Egypt. Question. Did God know that was going to happen? God knew it. God allowed it to happen. Did God make it happen? No. He allowed man to have free choice. And here's how amazing our God is, that He can still be sovereign and still be amazing and still be King of kings and Lord of lords while allowing us to have free choice. He can still accomplish His purpose. That's crazy. And so... There's a famine in the land, and Joseph's brothers have to come. They have to get corn. They go back, and they go back home, and they have to come back because the food runs out. He finds out Benjamin's alive, and the, the whole story. And finally, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. And then they want to wet their pants because they think, this guy is going to kill us. And he just wants to be restored. He says, go get, go get my dad. Go tell him that Joseph lives. Bring Benjamin, right? The whole, the whole story. And the, so the whole family comes. And, and it is crazy. And they're, they're scared he's, they're going to die. And this is his response. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 20. He says, but as for you, you thought evil against me. You thought evil against me. But God meant it unto what? All things work together for good. To them who love God. To them who are the called according to His purpose. You see, there was other people in the prison. They didn't get out. There were other people sold into slavery. They didn't get out. Only Joseph got the blessing. And Joseph, was he could see the difficulty or he could see the good in this. And he recognizes at the very end, wait a second, I'm now restored to my brother's. I see my dad one more time. My dad is able to bless my sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. He's able to say, you know what? You had a whole lot of evil in what you did to me. But God turned all that evil and made it good. He was able to see the good through the difficulty. Listen, when we get stuck in our flesh, there's times where we get so selfish. We get so focused on ourselves that we stop praying. We stop talking to God. We just stop. And the only time we talk to God is when we demand something that He give us. We become very selfish in our prayers. And what is the Spirit of God doing inside of us? It's groaning, isn't it? It's groaning saying, I'm praying according to the will of God. What was the will of God in verse 29? That we be conformed to the image of His Son. What is the Spirit of God groaning? Or whatever it takes, whatever it, do, whatever it causes to conform this believer into your image. Lord, do whatever it takes. Counteracting some of the prayers that I pray. The very thing I'm praying to get out of is the very thing I need because that's what's conforming to me to His image. And there's times where I don't know what God is doing and I'm going through the very difficult time. I can have a choice. I can see the difficulty or I can see the good. What is it that God is doing in this situation? This is another opportunity for me to trust God. God, have your perfect will and have your perfect work in me. Amen? Let's stand together. I fully intended that to be shorter. It wasn't. Dave, would you come on up? And here's the other thing. Let's come over here. I'm not preaching another message. But here's, here's another thing. <laughs> yeah. Remember what he said in, in, in chapter 8, in verse 29, at the very end, that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. The firstborn among many brethren. Listen, I think sometimes we, we think we live this life and we do, thing, do our own thing in a little bubble. And we have brothers in Christ. 
And there's times where I need to call my brother and say, I need you to be praying. And he prays. And there's times where he needs to yell at me and he yells. It happens. There's, there's times where there's times where I, I lose sight of some things. And I need a brother in Christ to come alongside. Just keep me focused. Hey, listen, God's doing some things here. We need each other. We need the body of Christ. That's why it's vital that we're here. That's why it's vital that we have relationships with one another. That's why it's vital that we pray with one another and we share each other's burdens because we know that all things work together for good. To them who love God and to them who are the called, we're the called unto his purpose. Let's pray. Pray for us.